I would like to. Uh, is the microphone working? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would like to uh, speak this morning on uh, first on two aspects in my sound work and uh, how I feel that uh, today's uh, programmable technology really um, uh, it affects and advances uh, this kind of work. Uh, the first um, is maybe the simplest to explain and that has to do with the structure of music over time. And it became uh, very interesting to me when I began my uh, first work, which was in 1967, actually, I, I began working with uh, telecommunications uh, resources. And at this time, I um, created a piece for an FM radio station in uh, Buffalo, New York. Perhaps you know of uh, the Center for the Creative and Performing Arts uh, was an organization that invited various guest composers from all over the world. It was very active for a while. So I was one of them, and, and at that time, um, I installed microphones in eight different remote locations in the area, and then um, uh, 15, thousand hertz uh, dedicated telephone lines to the microphones and the sound came live to the radio station uh, for a 28-hour broadcast where I was mixing these various remote sources and uh, the the sound for this particular production was close mic uh, The microphones were close to the sound sources, and they, they, they were different in environments in the local Buffalo area. And after that, I became um, very interested in using this technology to make deeper studies uh, in my studio. I was at MIT for a period of time, for a period of four years, at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies. And while I was there, I um, installed a microphone at the Boston Harbor. And for me, this was a, a, a really um, wonderful resource for studio studies. The microphone was, came, uh, was connected to my studio, again, with a, a dedicated high-quality quali high radio telephone line uh, for approximately three years. And it came into my mixing board, and I could walk into my room, and particularly late at night it was when I was most interested after midnight, 12 o'clock, when things really quieted down. And I could then um, begin to absorb uh, it was one factor of living with uh, this live sound like this, uh, almost the way you would turn on your radio or, or turn on records. I was able to live with this, but what was important to me is that I, I really learned what interested me, and I, I had no way to learn this in music. Uh, I learned about spatial perception and uh, spatial dimension in sound. I could hear sound very far away and close up, uh, things disappearing and appearing. And these are factors in my music and when I began that interested me, but in our musical, traditional musical presentations, usually everything is on a stage or in one place. So it's actually, it wasn't that I wanted the sounds of birds or the sounds of the harbor <laughs> or any of these sounds, I really wanted much more to, to uh, experience and learn about hearing and um, how, so that I could make an interval or I could make an instrument in my music that perhaps had some kind of similarity to the dimensions that we actually hear in, in life. And I think uh, 
it's one extension when John Cage talked uh, about the sounds around us. Um, my uh, interest is much more in how we as human perceivers are experiencing these sounds and that's really what's in the environment for me that, that interested me. And as I said, I, I was not, I'm not so interested in the sounds themselves. So with this same installation in my studio that I could make these studies and, and uh, observe things, I could also uh, use this um, live um, sound from the harbor in other shows and in other installations in other cities. Uh, while this was installed, I uh, did another radio production uh, for WBAI in New York where the sound from Boston and the sound from the New York Harbor uh, were then sent to uh, Radio Music France. Uh, and this was a half hour uh, live uh, broadcast. And I made a variety of different installations with this. And that, to me, was, is, is, is very convenient. Uh, I think it's a nice thing. It's like the fax machine now. You just hook up a, a telephone line. The sound <laughs> comes into your studio. You go to Australia. You know, you, all, all, all you need is the money to rent the line to bring, to bring this other environment or this other world, whatever it is. Um, uh, that you would like to to your uh, performing situation. So in this period of time, I made some 21 of uh, these different installations of, of live sound in different places, in museums and um, in radio stations. But I think the, the, the most um, valuable thing to me about it were really these uh, of course, it's always nice to have in a performance, but it was really these situations in my studio, uh, both in Boston and in New York, when I had uh, this, the sound coming in and I could analyze it and um, experience it and uh, uh, um, learn about uh, dimension in sound. So. After this period of work, I began, then as the computer programs became more possible, uh, and we, we now have them in the world, and uh, it, make, it also makes things much easier for us, um, I, it affected my thinking about structure. And I described these, uh, environmental works to, in order to give you some background to uh, how I think about musical structure now. Um, it became important to me, I, in my installations and performances, I've tried to stage the sound whenever I can uh, architecturally. And the idea of that is getting the sound to circulate uh, in the structure of the room uh, it, it, within the building. And often I like to make works that involve more than one room. And these works are called Music for Sound Join Rooms. And in these instances, I will have several rooms and I will install the sound. And it's what acousticians refer to as structure born sound when that happens, which uh, is interesting to me because if you play two speakers in a room and you're playing the tone middle C and the sound goes directly out into air, the middle C, the wavelength for middle C is four feet four inches, about this big. If it's traveling through the wood or uh, a stone also, the speed of sound is much faster. So that same middle C is no longer four feet in wavelength. It is actually 19 feet. And the wave is much larger. And of course, as the sounds get lower, they, they are even much larger than that. And intuitively, I didn't realize this in the beginning. Uh, I just 
uh, stage my sound this way because it's, I preferred hearing it than having it in the, in, in the room directly in air. And later, um, uh, I, I realized this factor and it, 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 it makes quite a difference, I think, in experiencing music. So as a result of these architectural stagings, uh, in which I, t I have staged the music as much as possible structurally and made sets, I, I realized as a result of uh, present day um, technology something quite interesting that really in a, 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 f a few years, I mean right now we have samplers that can do everything, but in an... Um, well, probably in a matter of two years, there'll be very good variation makers. So what that means is really, uh, it can take my music, a variation maker, and perhaps in a few years later, people will have in their homes these same variation makers. <laughs> and be, uh, very extended pro a program will be available to make uh, quite wonderful variations of everyone's music. And uh, it will be very simple. So where does that leave someone who's actually uh, seriously working in the profession of music if uh, this becomes so available and so possible? So then to uh, resolve this problem, I think that uh, the whole idea of structure of music over time, or the flow, or the distribution of worlds, or changes of sound becomes very important, because that's a more difficult thing uh, to actually uh, design a little program for. Someone has to really beforehand uh, imagine it, perhaps eventually uh, very interesting um, knowledge will develop about cre creating changes and creating worlds maybe somewhere in the late 1990s, but right now uh, it doesn't exist. You can take any form of minimal music. I mean, it's nothing to just sample this, and uh, it, it will be not difficult to make any variation. So if you're actually making something, I don't know, there's just not much point unless um, maybe you're doing something that takes three weeks before a new software uh, can actually be in, uh, invented to um, make a variation or duplicate your work. So because of this factor, I then became interested in making what I call dramatic forms in space in which uh, there are extreme changes um, in, through the structure in time. And it, this description relates to the work uh, that I'm presenting here, uh, which I call a mini sound series. And I uh, adapted this idea from television and from comic books because I think the form is really very interesting. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, we exist in the world and, and uh, in whatever our musical tradition is, and the idea is you go in one night and you do a performance and, and you leave and people get like it and get excited or they hate it or whatever, and um, everyone, uh, this is the way it goes. But on the other hand, television and comic books have something that's very in involving. Uh, the stories continue, the music continues, and uh, I didn't realize all this when I began. my, my first mini sound series was in San Francisco and it was a six part and it was distributed over six weeks which for me I think is is the most interesting way of presenting these works because people hear them they go away if they want to come back they tell other people uh, a real kind of dialogue gets um, set up it's as though you you become interested in a, in a story on television and you look at it next week, um, or you don't. My, my experience, it was a wonderful relationship with the audience in almost every one of these I have done, that if I'd come to this situation and had done two separate um, concerts, it would not, I don't think it would have uh, 
uh, for me, I don't think it would have been as as meaningful as this idea that you 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 leave, and even though the piece isn't continuing, audibly it still uh, it, it it still exists. And my reason for I I I chose also to do this because I was interested in a form that was not a continuous installation which of course we have now very many in the world continuous sound installations sound are um, I nor a conventional concert format so with the many sound series I'm able to make something that does evolve over time um, and I'm able to to make a story and I'm able to explore these uh, dramatic changes of music over time that I, I spoke of earlier that I think because of, uh, to me, becomes important because of existing technology and because someone's going to make a, a software to, do, uh, to make a variation of my, my music in a few days. And so I, I would like to create something that maybe makes that just a little more difficult to discover the laws of structure. And so afterwards you can, there can be a question period about the ideas of structure that I'm just talking about. And the second um, advantage for me of, and how I approach uh, programmable instruments is what now I just call um, the listener's music. Um, and this is a topic that's been buried um, really uh, forever until now. Um, that's the factor that we as listeners, as human beings, when we hear, in the most simple case, two sine waves, two sine tones, we immediately create three more quite obvious tones in our ears. And uh, in all orchestral music and all music, uh, this happens and it happens on a subliminal level and it probably happens a lot really in good performances that, that um, really sensitive performers and musicians are experiencing these maybe more vividly and they're hearing them and perhaps it's, it's, it explains one of the, one of the reasons that people might respond more to, it's, it's, it's one of the factors, not one of the, the reasons really, but one of the factors that might make a, a performance a little more moving uh, or more special to, to people experience it because the, the performer has uh, really enhanced these things in whatever, in, in the, from his piano playing or from the conductor from the orchestra. and. Uh, so now, uh, with programmable technology, we can actually study these. Um, before I started uh, first doing it with just oscillators, and of course that's very difficult, but now it's quite simple to make. I have a program that, um, unfortunately I brought some samples, but um, I can't show them on the... Uh, this is a different overhead. But I have a simple program that says, let me hear X. And uh, maybe you can see, I can show you later. X would be this low tone right here, this low D. And here is a sample of just a few intervals. And so in, in my program, the, the person goes to, um, the computer and specifies uh, one tone that he wants to examine as it appears as a first order difference tone, second or third order. And then the program sounds whatever intervals, if you wish to examine the third, fourth, fifth uh, octave, 
uh, in whatever tuning system you might want. The program then s sounds those intervals, and you can sit back and see how the tone quality of this D, this D on this page, uh, differs from in the different intervals that you actually hear it. And so to me, this, this is really um, a very um, exciting uh, feature to, to be able to have a program that does this. And it's, it's very simple, but it, in, it enables me to, to really uh, in, investigate these in a way that uh, could, could never happen before. And then uh, a second program enables me to enhance, uh, to, to select from these combinations and reinforce and enhance these kind of tones that are in, let's say, a body of timbre or a body of uh, music that I've created. I'm able to um, bring out uh, certain uh, tones this way from, from using this basic material. And the, I think just, um, well, besides these technical factors, I think it's, 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 it's really a, a curious issue because, um, as I said, this has been buried for years and years, and it's called psychoacoustic phenomena. The tones that we make as human responders, there really are response tones that we really stand or sit or whatever we, when we're experiencing music, and we are creating other tones that go along with the tones that are sounding. And I think in the early days, like in Vivaldi, you hear a lot of this in, in, in Vivaldi's music, before, and also before notation really got off, people, the, the musicians probably gave a lot of attention to this. But then the notation started to become very important, and so uh, it was only the notes that, that, that are sounding in the room which I call the A tones, the acoustic tones, the B tones are here, the C tones are here, which I haven't discussed yet. But, uh, and so to me, it, it, it's so incredible because it, it seems like in all our music background, we, I don't know what we learn really. Uh, it's as though when I was studying music, to learn about overtones, to learn about the physics of sound was like something only for scientists. It was, you were to uh, psychoacousticians. And so what you, in my musical background, really what I was learning was now what samplers do, simply to rearrange the patterns and the figures of really other men's music and make a personalized form of this for myself. I wasn't learning anything about these very basic physics. And it's not that I want to, to uh, know that much, but, but there are certain things that, that we exist in this world and that the, the, for one thing, we are making these tones and we're totally unconscious of all of this. So in my work now, it's, it's uh, a major concern to, to try to compose consciously with these factors, and now is really the first time, actually, that it's possible, and that's because you're able to, to, to make a sufficient program to uh, study these things in a, in a conscious way, other than improvising and hearing nice tones and saying, oh, gee, this is good, this does something to me. Uh, you can really make a very objective music um, from this, and in my own work, I do work very uh, objectively like that, and I work a lot with the second factor of our sense as human responders is what ac acousticians call pattern modulation uh, or auditory um, beats in the brain. And as far as I know, it's not exactly clear what uh, the research has n n not knowledge of what actually is sounding, if it's some resonance in the neurons or not. But how this, the specific example of this is, 
if you take uh, the attuning close to the fifth octave or fourth, and you arrange the beats so that they become very slow, and they're slowing down, there are many patterns. And I, I had brought an article from Scientific American that I, I was going to project uh, of a study that was made by Gnarly, uh, where people uh, experience different shapes. Now, I had always done this when I began composing, but I, and I had many strange names for these effects. So when I finally found the some articles, they were very helpful to me because um, I knew that I was not listening too long, that, that actually there was fundamental research done, that people hear spirals, they hear curves, they hear various shapes. And this is very um, simple. In, in the, the book of Rodier, he, he studies the monaural case. And monarly, you if you take the beat at the octave or the fifth or the fourth, you will hear the same shapes and the same patterns, which then tells uh, the acousticians that this is not in the cochlea at all, like the other tones, which are mechanical and are called first order effects. These are tones that we simply add to the music. Are, are the, from the vibration of our tympanic membrane and the spots on our ear. But the second order effects are how we're able to extract information and actually make these patterns and these shapes. And without doing it consciously, I, in my own work, often begin this way because I'm able to make very, very uh, nice melodies where uh, they surprise me, and I do it through tuning. And uh, through this, th this matter of taking simple intervals and hearing certain shapes. And in terms of our experiences, it really is very, very different because I, I have uh, made recordings, a complete tape of really fundamentally the same uh, timbres, the same uh, well, music, really, except for a slight shift in uh, what is phase or, or these shapes that I'm talking about from, from actual, whether the, the wave is very steady or whether it just moves a little bit. And the, these variations are all very different, how you experience them. They're very different. And... Um, this is something uh, I suppose that will be uh, uh, eventually analyzed, how this uh, happens. Um, so I haven't yet uh, made the uh, study for this work, which would be simply um, stopping at each point and getting the patterns uh, between the very fast beats and the very slow beat, when the wave is almost touching and in tune. And the other factor is it's very interesting when you look at the octave in music. Uh, I didn't realize, uh, I had made some notes a long time ago, and I was actually going to show this, because I, I looked at it the other day, and it's so beautiful. Uh, when it's only one octave apart, we have a, the tones we are sounding in our ear, let's say, if it's two Cs, middle C and uh, two octaves above, we create a, a G and a C and an E. And then you take it one other octave, and uh, there's an A and a G and a G sharp. Or, and it goes on like this, but when you get to the octave plus five, when it's very low and very high, all the tones we are making in our ear are also C. They're also, uh, and I, I'm, I've actually um, experienced this in tuning, and it, this is a, uh, something we can do really electronically that uh, 
is to me quite exciting that uh, we, we, we can't do with instruments. We can actually make these tunings from the very bottom to the very top. And uh, uh, it, it, it's a very uh, wonderful uh, experience. And I, I really wonder, I don't know, I think it's because maybe suddenly at this point you get this sensation of like a pole. And it could be that, it, it, it could be because finally at this point we're creating all the seas in response inside our ear instead of when it's just uh, one C to the next C, we have like three different tones, an E and a G and a B or whatever it is. Uh, so maybe it's just my, my personal, uh, but I think it's very beautiful that that happens. And I think it's unfortunate that all of this has been so buried. Um, in as psychoacoustic uh, phenomena and and called that and uh, there was again I get back to this thing that as musicians or composers we're supposed to walk around as uh, kind of uh, dummies just uh, writing these things and not and not knowing how um, uh, they affect any of this and so now maybe with uh, programmable instruments, this will become a more conscious factor in, in uh, composition and really um, uh, experiences of, uh, of this can be uh, enhanced much more for the, for the listener. So, um, I don't know if any of you have any questions right now on that or if you would rather wait till um, how, how long have I been talking? I'm afraid. <laughs> no, I just am concerned that maybe I'm, I'm talking too much. Uh, I didn't realize. How, how much more time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes? Oh, okay. Well, then all right, quickly I, I'll say something then to get into the visual. Uh, I myself am very interested in what I, uh, I think will happen soon. And so I try in, my, in some of my pieces where I'm able to, to make sets. Uh, it's like a little make-believe of, of something I think might be possible in maybe five or six years. I have a number of friends that are working in this area of virtual environments, it's called, and they work right now. I worked at MIT with um, Scott Fisher, who's now designed the helmet for the astronauts uh, that enables you to wear this helmet and you move your hand and it's a remote and it's as though you are in this three-dimensional space. Unfortunately, you have to wear the helmet, but we all dream of the time when actually uh, the, such a virtual environment could be reconstructed in a room and could simulate uh, the first order of this would be to simulate another, uh, another room, uh, another place, another environment, like a photograph, but it would be a, a, a virtual uh, construction of this, uh, a, a somehow like a, a, th a three-dimensional projection. Now, this is a very interesting thing to think about as an artist, because I think the first level of course, that will happen will be would be able to bring the Bruckner, the uh, Stifter Saul space in here and reconstruct it, and and make this room. Uh, but I think even in this first order, there there will be difficulties uh, on the level of certain subliminal uh, sounds that really are clues. They are like codes to how we uh, recognize a place or a space, and even though, again, we are not conscious of these kind of tones in the environment, this is, I learned this from actually my environmental work in the, with the Boston Harbor. I didn't set out to say, oh, I want to find the resonant frequency or the tone, the hidden tones of these places, but I had it for two and a half years and suddenly I realized that there was a whole, like, uh, you know, there, there was a fundamental the tone, there was a tone that was going on that was different than the, the, the tone in the space around where I was working, where I was born, where I grew up. Uh, and 
I, uh, also, I did a, a long work with John Cage, where uh, uh, Empty Words, Close Up is the name of the work, and the sound recordings I made for that were at Walden uh, Pond. But these recordings were to me uh, nothing. What I did was extract, uh, try to extract on the very subliminal level what the kind of undercurrent or the code of this uh, space was, what I would hear on, on this most basic level. And I, I think for recreating the virtual environments in the future in terms of sound and in terms of images, there will be these kind of clues that will have to be worked out and the knowledge will have to be inserted in the uh, programming to make it a vivid or to make it a, a, a very real simulation. And there, there's a lot of work in this area because uh, a lot of these things are still quite buried. I think uh, in advertising, uh, people are uh, of course, may, may be more knowledgeable about this because they, I don't know if they really are, but at least they're interested because they want to manipulate people, uh, maybe into, you know, in order to sell their products. But uh, it, it's, it's for a, a different uh, reason. And the, the second factor, I think, in, in the uh, virtual environments that will become interesting, once these problems are solved, then, if you have like the photograph made of the place, then the artist really has to begin to think of um, the ways of changing this, the ways of almost as a painter um, makes paintings of all, all different scenes doing strange things. Like I, I, I can imagine like a Dada period, um, a, a, all these strange things happening with these three-dimensional spaces, but this is after everyone is, will be very happy that you can have this simulation of this place and isn't this wonderful. Then the artist will come in and um, do whatever um, exotic or curious things because it will help this situation because if we live in a world with all these uh, kind of exact simulations, I think it will be, you know, it just will get very boring. And so the, uh, in, the, in the future, I think this will, will uh, preoccupy, it, it will be um, um, something that, that people will be involved with. Is, how about the, the time? Would you? Some pictures. Oh, what I is? can I can just show a few. Uh, yeah. I just brought a few uh, images here. Uh, these are from um, the work I described, the architectural stagings, uh, and which were into uh, many sound series. And these are some examples of some sets. Now you can imagine this. This is an actual stairway. Uh, in the room, and this was a duplicate of the couch of Freud uh, with a rug, and the, the story had to do with these, and so I was using the, this is an emblem of the um, unconscious on that level. This is another sh shot. But my uh, friend working in, in NASA said that you can, uh, likes to see these in the sense that they, um, if you could imagine these as not being a real stairway, um, but actually being a, a simulation, this, this is a real stairway. Oh, did I unplug this? It's not uh, advancing. Oh, I did unplug it. Um, excuse me, uh, I, my cable came unplugged. Oh, is it just here? Oh, thanks. And this is the same stairway.
And in this, people walked into the space and the sound was staged. And this was in uh, San Francisco in the Cap Street, an installation in the Cap Street Gallery. Uh, and it is a house, uh, a relatively modern kind of curved house that was uh, designed by David Ireland uh, for this gallery. And uh, artists are invited for six weeks to work and six weeks to actually uh, create a, a project. And that's a child's, little child's chair. That's not really how it looked. It was taken by the photographer with the light. It's the same space. But I like to imagine these. Oh, I, that's the same space, actually. But it's a different um, light, which the photographer added. But I like to imagine these not as, uh, oh, now this is not working, as simulations more than uh, actual, uh, well, shall, what shall I say, actual buildings as though, think of them as though we had a simulated environment. And this is in the, um, from an installation in the DID gallery in Berlin, where I did a, um, a four part mini sound series over four weeks. And it was called The Music Rooms. And the idea of this uh, work was, had to do with the power of music and uh, this music that affects us and we don't know why we like it, we don't know, I mean, we just have, have this music. So in the hallway, I used two elements. I used uh, props from the uh, German opera warehouse that were, um, you know, in the, in the big storage room, some of them look slightly abandoned. They were they were used in 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 many productions, and they were props from um, uh, Das Rheingold, the um, and Salome, the and swords from Siegfried, and the head of uh, Johannes from the opera Salome, and. Uh, a mirror from the opera Lulu. These were elements in the set. And then in the entrance, I had made um, four uh, large murals of uh, images and uh, texts from the popular music press uh, from England, New Music Express and Melody Maker. And to me, it's again this whole question examining of music because there was t there's really not a lot of difference between these uh, newsprints from the pop music press and the images of the um, musicians and their, their, uh, their slogans and their text as in the same kind of power symbols that were in the opera. And so I used the four rooms uh, for this, and this was the, the entrance to uh, one with the props from uh, Das Rheingold, the gold. And this was the entrance way to the room. And this is another view of it. And this was in another room. Uh, this is a real music stand, the rest are projections. And there was a video installation in the room across the hall that had the twin image of uh, this uh, face. And it was in the room on the opposite side of the gallery uh, on a very small monitor in this gold uh, Wagner room. And this was a mirror. This is the mirror from Lula, which you can't see there. And that's more lit. This is the head of Johannes. And this oh, is a projection. And again, a twin face that was on the other side. And here's a bit of the pile of uh, Siegfried, uh, the swords, which can't be seen there. 
And this was the entranceway with the, uh, with the pop press about music. And then my music, the story of this was intended to make, in, was intended to really provoke questions about this, uh, these myths and all of this in music and w w why it exists in the world and why we have it and why, why it's in every restaurant. And, and these are just some video um, installations where, where I, uh, well, in Berlin, I, I have written a story about uh, the work of various uh, musicians it takes place sometime in the future, and they have a laboratory. And of course, this is a wonderful laboratory. It's not like a <laughs> like a normal. It's really a virtual environment where uh, this they would go in, and this would be an actual three dimensional, and they have things come out of the floor, and uh, they make all their sound researches and their visual researches in this 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 really. Um, exotic place, and it's actually like a little bit that exists in medicine right now when a neurosurgeon, uh, instead of looking, well, I realized this, I didn't know why I was so intrigued with making their laboratory, and then I, I, I realized what it was all about, because uh, right now to examine, for, uh, for example, cell structures, you look through a microscope, but imagine if you actually walked into this same structure and it was around you just as a neurosurgeon uh, does not have to hold up an x-ray and ex examine uh, the picture. He could actually walk in before the operation to a three-dimensional simulation and, and sort of practice, well, I'm going to move this and I'm going to change this, you know, and the person's brain that he's about to operate on, he, he would actually walk into into this, uh, the whole geography of the brain, rather than uh, looking at it on a picture. So that's why I decided that that's what I was really trying to make with this simulation of this laboratory, which involves these cells that they're studying and uh, all, all sorts of exotic things, and, uh, and also art, which is not just hanging on the walls, but might come out of the floor. and. Um, so they're, they're better able to study human beings because I, I really feel myself that uh, we probably are coming into an interesting time. Uh, first, there was the bi biological revolution and then the computer revolution. And I think really the, the next uh, real, really significant change is, is, is going to happen in uh, the science of mind, that it will really be mind science, that uh, finally these tools will enable us to, uh, to, to know much more about our own sensitivity and uh, our, it really our experience as human beings. And there's, there's real evidence for this in, in the sense of the founders of these fields, uh, Francis Crick, who uh, really is dedicated to uh, you know, Francis Crick, I mean the DNA, the founder of DNA um, research, who, who has been for years now in neuroscience and really studying perception. Okay, I, uh, and the other figure, for example, uh, Marvin Minsky in artificial intelligence uh, is much more involved in mind science than really uh, hardware and, and that. And this, we, to, to develop this begins with these very basic studies in, in our perceiving. These are just some more. I think I should stop the time. These are the twin characters. OK. Um, I think I should stop so that you can ask me questions about all this. I feel sorry, but, but it's not possible to ask. <laughs> as, as I told you before, we don't have the time that for, but if you could pass over here for just some ideas about your work, please. You know, there are always other people following, so right. we have to be a little bit economic with yeah, time. Sure. 
now should the next one start. <laughs> right. So uh, I think the crucial thing within your work, and which is very interesting and intriguing, is first the experimental char character of your whole uh, proposition, what is music today, and second, the interactive aspect. Could you define a bit more exact what you mean with interactivity? Well, actually, uh, the interaction I wanted to make for this particular festival, the concept uh, we were not able to develop, and that was a telecommunication link with New York City. And uh, the interaction was what I uh, call now second order interaction because it's, this is described in the catalog. It was not, uh, oh, I talk here, a, a telephone a link would have been made uh, to a various, I was going to use the Times Square um, underground because of uh, various musical elements that are happening there, the Peruvian musicians, but the interactive element to try to be quick was this sound would have then been transmitted to a studio in New York with another composer who would be uh, performing with me here in Linz, but his program, his interaction program, would not be simply dealing with the acoustic information that I was sending him or that he was receiving from Times Square, but the program would really uh, decode the tones that uh, the listeners in the Stifter saw were the prominent, most important tones that were being uh, taking shape in their ear. And then he, uh, the what I call the intelligence in New York, then would make the interaction by sending complementary tones back. And to me, this is very different than if my violin or my piano changes your images or uh, my trumpet changes your piano. Uh, it's very different than acoustic information. It, it, it's dealing with another level of perception. So this would have been what you also mentioned, dramatic forms in space. Well, I, do, I can do that without this, but, uh, but this, I think it, it would have been quite thrilling because it, it would have been live, but the dramatic forms in space I'm actually doing here. I see. Right now. So but th this is quite a new territory you are working within, and I think usually we don't know a lot about, but there are some other people who are interested in taking just sounds from the environment, and I think John Cage, whom you mentioned, was the first one who was focusing on this problem. But you said you are not so much interested in the sound itself, but what happens with it within your mind, etc. Yes. And, and the environment in that sense, that uh, it's it, not so much because I hear all these different sounds, but because I hear things in a way, there are many ways of hearing. When I go out the door, I hear sounds far away, I hear sounds close up, I hear things to the right, I hear things to the left, and this is very wonderful. And in music, normally we hear things in one place. And we. And this experience, this is what I like from the environment and why I was actually involved with environmental music. So finally, this is a kind of a interactive experience of music which everybody could have, and you show how it works. Well, maybe yeah. you could say well, that. Thank yeah, you very much. Sure. Thanks. Damit wir die Themen nicht allzu sehr durcheinander vermischen, jetzt machen wir zehn Minuten Pause und hoffen, um Punkt 4. nach 11 Uhr mit dem nächsten Vortrag einsetzen zu können. Vielen Dank. I beg your pardon? Oh, I don't know what, what... The resolution of this particular monitor is what we call a megapixel, which is a million pixels, and which is far higher than what those monitors are capable of, of displaying. And uh, the um, refresh rate of the screen is 60 kilohertz, and so it takes a, a very um, high-end projector uh, like the Barco in order to be able to display a screen. Um, a, few, a few facts about the next computer. It is um, 
Uh, first of all, a, uh, I mentioned the megapixel display. The display is what we call um, display postscript, um, and which means that what you see on the screen is virtually what you get when you um, send to any kind of printer or any sort of output device which also recognizes PostScript. The um, computer itself uh, comes standard with 8 megabytes of memory and a 256 megabyte optical read-write disk. Um, that, that in itself is a very important piece of technology because uh, for people who are dealing with high resolution images and sounds uh, on a regular basis, you know that those uh, images and sounds require a great deal of storage. Uh, uh, many, there are many megabytes in length, for instance, a, uh, a 20 minute uh, sound sampled at uh, um, CD quality stereo would be over 200 megabytes um, that, you know, not being compressed. So it's, it's possible to take your optical disks and store um, files that have large images and sounds and put them on the shelf and uh, put in another optic. So you don't fill up your hard disk drive with lots of images and sounds. Now that's, a, that's an extremely important feature. Um, this particular machine has 60 megabytes of memory and a 670 megabyte hard disk drive. Uh, the next machine only comes with two hard disk drives available. The small one is 330 megabytes. So it's a machine which is very much designed for uh, the requirements of dealing with multimedia and those requirements being um, lots of storage and lots of memory. The operating system is Unix and uh, it's um, a uh, kind of a Unix called Mach, which is M-A-C-H. It was developed at Carnegie Mellon, and it is uh, a, a uh, version of Unix which is particularly um, uh, suited to parallel processing. Um, it was developed at Carnegie Mellon such that their uh, computers, which are networked across campus, would simultaneously be able to um, work on different parts of the, same, of the same task. So in the next machine, which has uh, currently only one processor, or I should say, well, there are two processors, but the central processor is a 68030 uh, with a floating point processor and running at 25 megahertz. Um, they also are, there are also I.O. processors on all of the major um, uh, components, the memory, the disk, the uh, uh, backplane and all of that sort of thing, which, um, and, and because of those I.O. processors, you get a, an approximate throughput of five MIPS or five million instructions per second, which is about uh, a little more than four times faster than, say, a Mac II. Um, the, the importance of having the mock uh, version of Unix is that when you look at the cube here, that's what we call it. We don't call it a, a, a Mac or a this or a that. It's called the cube. Um, it's made out of magnesium, which is, I don't know why, but it is. Uh, at any rate, uh, the cube has four slots in it. And each one of those slots is capable of, of carrying a, a central, uh, an entire uh, Next computer. The, the whole um, Next computer is on a single board. So all of the processors, memory, uh, et cetera, et cetera, is all on a single board. So it, it seems um, likely or, or at least possible that in the future of this machine, uh, they will be able to insert uh, boards, whole next computers, so that you might have uh, two, three, or even four processors, and therefore a parallel processing computer. Um, currently, of course, uh, that's not possible. I should also mention that the uh, optical disk drive is single-sided and not double-sided, and there's every reason to believe that they would put in a double-sided uh, disk drive eventually, which would then give you the capacity for storing uh, close to about 600 megabytes on your optical disks. Um, let's see. 
I think the, the important thing that, that I want to stress about the next computer, and maybe I should say a little bit about, uh, uh, very briefly, what, what my background is. Uh, at the University of Michigan, I direct the Center for Performing Arts and Technology. Um, at one time, I was the chairman of the dance department. I'm trained as a composer, and I've done a lot of work with um, people like the Nikolai, or Alan Nikolai, Murray Lewis. Um, and multimedia is the thing I'm most interested in, that is, uh, combinations of, of sounds and images, uh, in particular in live performance. Um, at the School of Music at the University of Michigan, we have over 1,000 majors, 1,000 students studying music, dance, and theater, and we give over 300 performances in a nine-month period. And so uh, it became uh, apparent that one of the things we needed to do was somehow take this technology and see what, see what kinds of things we could do with it in live performance and in particular uh, uh, real-time applications, or at least what we like to say reasonable time um, applications. Um, and so when we were casting about looking for an appropriate computer uh, to do multimedia work, uh, we started very early on with uh, a Mac. Um, actually, uh, prior to that, I was a fellow at Carnegie Mellon and developed a a piece of software, um, very uh, just a prototype called Computerized Dance Theater on an IBM RT, and uh, which simulated the uh, capability of taking multiple dancers on stage and moving them around in real time using the mouse and then replaying it to get a, um, a notion of what multiple bodies would look like moving across on a stage. And it was a prototype thing, and it was done in 2D, so it was all real fake. and. Um, but still, it gave people the notion of, of what I was looking for and uh, wanting to add sound to that sort of thing and, and so on and so forth. So um, after that, we looked at the Mac II and begun, or began some uh, preliminary work on that uh, and quickly found out that it wasn't, uh, wasn't fast enough, didn't have the, the uh, necessary amounts of memory, uh, didn't solve the storage problems, didn't solve the networking problems, and, and in short, it didn't solve any of our problems. Um, it, uh, um, in the, we were one of the beta developers for the Mac II. In fact, I still have one that doesn't have a lid on it, uh, because the early Mac IIs, they, they manufactured at the plant and uh, built the power unit too high, and uh, afterwards realized that they couldn't fit the lid on it after they uh, made the power unit too high. So that's, that's the Mac II I started with. And at the original non-disclosure meeting, they uh, discussed uh, CD quality sound. They told us that the Mac II would have CD quality sound uh, input and output, and, and of course it doesn't. So um, you now are able to get, of course, wonderful boards that you can plug into it. But, but for our, from our point of view, we really wanted to uh, find some box that had most everything in it and that we wouldn't have to add lots of expensive peripherals to come up with a system that, that we could um, do the thing we wanted to do. Well, that's uh, in the best of all worlds, uh, which, um, if you know that expression, uh, the best of all worlds is never the case. And so what we found in the next machine was a system that did not offer us everything that we wanted to begin with, but offered us some very um, seductive kinds of uh, features and, and a sort of a promise to the future that makes a lot more sense than anything else that we had encountered. The, um, I did uh, fail to mention one uh, unique aspect of the machine, uh, which is that it has a digital signal processor on board. Uh, that digital signal processor, processor is the 56001 Motorola chip which has a throughput of about 10 uh, MIPS, or 10 million instructions per second, and is uh, very well suited to uh, array processing, which is good for real-time uh, sound synthesis and uh, things like processing matrices for um, computer graphics and, and that sort of thing. So um, uh, after all of that, um, what I will begin to demonstrate here is some of the early work uh, that we've done on the creation station to begin with, and um, I'll, I'll describe it and where we're going with it. I promised I would finish at noon, so if you have any questions, uh, I won't be able to see you raise your hand. So um, I'll, every once in